Okay. Speaking of the fact that hell is an eternal place, somehow Jesus suffered an eternity of hell in those three days and three nights, if you, if you think about what this verse is saying in Jonah 2. Okay, go back in your Old Testament to Jonah 2. You know, again, you have this, this whole thing of Anderson just taking verses completely out of their context and just, you know, oh, this means that and, you know, whatever, whatever. And um, see which one it was that he was... Uh, Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Okay. Um, for thou hadst, I'll read verse 3. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. All right. Now, Anderson here is referring to, Jesus says about, you know, he compares himself to the prophet Jonas. You know, and of course that's a reference to Jonah here. Jonas is your Greek word coming to English. Jonah is the Hebrew word coming to English. So, same word, just spelled differently in two different languages. But Jesus says about that, you know, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, even so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So, he's comparing it. And Jonah, here, he calls being down there in the depth of the sea, he calls that hell down there. And again, this is a whole other big study but the fact of the matter is that when you get really 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 deep down in there it is you know you're getting close to to hell you're getting close to the heart of the earth and that's why i believe that jonah said what he said and again you know you can also make the argument that he did die and i do believe that jonah did die in the in the whale's belly and actually went to what the bible refers to as hell uh, being that thing there in the Old Testament where you have the people burning in that side of hell, the people in Abraham's bosom in this side of hell. And Jonah was re resurrected, brought back to life. Again, you know, if he was just alive down there in the fish's belly the whole time, it's not really a good comparison to what Jesus Christ went through. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again three days later. Jonah died, was in hell down there, spiritually speaking, and then he was resurrected, puked out by the whale. <laughs> but uh, that's what's going on. So, but to say that, uh, you know, that, see, Jonah, this proves that, that, you know, he was down there in hell burning and things like this. And, and same thing as Jesus burning in hell. Absolutely ridiculous. But let's continue here. Because a lot of people, when you try to explain this to them, that, you know, Jesus Christ... He died on the cross, and his soul was in hell for three days and three nights, and then he rose again. A lot of people just, they have trouble with this doctrine because they've been taught something else, okay? Uh, but honestly, it is a biblical doctrine. There are other passages we could turn to. We've got Psalm 16. We've got Jonah 2. We've got Matthew 12, 40. We've got Ephesians 4 that talks about Jesus descending into the lower parts of the earth. We also have hundreds of scriptures on burnt offerings. We have all the scriptures about the Passover being roast with fire. We have all this evidence. But what people will bring out, and this is probably the most common objection I've heard to this teaching. They'll bring out this verse from John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And they'll say, see right there, when Jesus was on the cross, they'll say, he said, it's finished. Now, what they're interpreting that as is that everything that needed to be done for our salvation was finished. Who's heard that interpretation of that verse? Just pause it right there. You'll see this thing over and over and over again. He will mock Bible doctrine. Everything that needed to be done for our salvation. See, he's mocking. And that blood that was shed on the cross, we saw in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it's the blood 
that purchases us. Hmm. How about that? The blood is what is where the remission of sins is. It's not his burial and resurrection. That just goes along with him being God and not being a regular man like other people would. You know, if he was just a man, his blood being shed, and yet he didn't come up from the dead, well, it wouldn't have been much good. Okay, so that, those things are, that came after our salvation. But it's the blood that created the New Testament. It's the blood that washes our sin away. You know, I mean, scripture after scripture after scripture, blood, it's the blood that is the remission for our sins. So yes, in that sense, when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, that's because the blood was shed. Now watch what Anderson says here. All over the building. People will always say that when Jesus said it is finished, everything that was needed for our salvation was done. It's all been done. We don't have to do anything. It's finished. Now, that sounds good. It makes a good sermon. But here's the thing. Not true. Because he hadn't even risen from the dead yet. I hadn't even risen from the dead yet. It's not true. It's not true. The blood there was not, that's not it. That's not your salvation. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Anderson says, oh, there's plenty of scriptures out of here and stuff. Well, why don't you tell us what those scriptures are there? Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. If you have an NIV, it's not going to be in there. Or they'll take out the blood, I should say. The verse is there, but they take out the blood. Anderson should approve of that. It says here, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. See the eternal nature there of Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. He is before all things and by him all things consist. That's a sobering thought. You reject Jesus Christ, you're rejecting your life source. Hmm. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why would Jesus be the firstborn of their, it says there, the firstborn from the dead, if there were people in heaven? Hmm, interesting. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And look at this, verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Hmm. Interesting there. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't happen to see burning in there. That was the blood of the cross that paid for our sins. So when Jesus dies on the cross and he says it is finished, it was finished at that point. And Anderson just openly rejected it said that Jesus Christ was in hell. Which, by the way, let me show you another verse while I'm thinking about this. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You say, well, I think he's saved. I just think, you know, he's just mistaken in this one point. But other than that, he's a fine preacher. Uh, well, let me just show you a, a real problem. Actually, you know what? Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we're going to go to Galatians chapter 1. Let me show you this verse. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 6, it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Kind of like Anderson. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Two times it's said there, this thing of being accursed. Now, accursed, here in the New Testament, there's a bunch of references in the Old Testament. We're not going to go over all those, but uh, keep your hand there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're getting to it. But go back in your Bible to Romans chapter 9. 
Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now look at this, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, it says in verse 4. But, you know, so this, oh, it's spiritual Jews. He's not talking about spirit, spiritual Jews there. You know, according to the flesh, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's not talking about spiritual Jews. But Paul is actually saying that if it meant the salvation of the nation of Israel, he'd be willing to go to hell, accursed from Christ. So somebody who's accursed from Christ is in hell. Now we'll go to where you were waiting for. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now we're going to see something very interesting that again proves that Stephen Anderson is definitely a lost man. And I use the term man very lightly. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Look at verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, Get, got to get that one with the old carriage. Max will say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. You know, because it says here, uh, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So they say, you know, some of the new versions will take out the, the definitive, definitive article there. So it's, Jesus says, the Lord. If you have the Holy Ghost, you can say that. If you don't, you won't say that. So a lot of these charismatic nuts that you're coming out saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. They're just proving that they don't have the Spirit of God. It's kind of funny. But you see there, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Stephen Anderson is, is preaching and teaching that Jesus is accursed. He's in hell, burning. That's accursed. He's not speaking by the Spirit of God. Proven. Right there. Proven from Scripture. But let's continue doesn't mean that he's not going to be dead for three days and three nights in hell. Okay. Again, you see this thing that, you know, Jesus is dead and, and he's three days and three nights in hell. You know, and again, I ask the question, if Jesus, body, soul, and spirit, he's totally dead, he's in hell burning for three days and three nights, who's running heaven? It's a problem. But let's continue. And so that's all we have time for tonight. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's something that people get emotional about just because they, they, they have their mind set a certain way. But Acts 2.31 is pretty clear. And if you disagree, if you say, well, you know, I don't think Jesus went uh, to hell for three days and three nights. You know, you don't have to believe that to be saved. Because what you have to believe to be saved is the death, burial, and resurrection. So, Okay, so uh, let me just pause it there for a minute. You don't have to believe that Jesus burned in hell to be saved. It's the death, burial, and resurrection. Huh? What? You know, see, again, he's such a liar. That's the thing. This, the spirit that is in Stephen Anderson, and that's why I call him Anders Snake. The same reason Jesus called the, the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, of his day, he called them vipers. You know, that's why I call him Anders Snake, because he's got a spirit of Satan, a, a lying devil spirit within him. You know, you don't have to believe that, that Jesus burned in hell for three days and three nights to be saved. <laughs> but he's been saying it. It's absolutely ridiculous. But let's continue. The part that you have to believe in to be saved is that Jesus was bodily killed and bodily buried and bodily risen again from the dead. But honestly, if you want to have true biblical doctrine, you must acknowledge the fact that Jesus fulfilled the Passover requirement to a T including the portion on being roasted with fire, because Jesus Christ did go to hell for three days and three nights. So the Passover requirement, you know, was that he had to roast, he had to be roasted with fire. Um, no. Uh, I mean, and again, where's this at in Scripture? Where does it say Passover requirement? Where's this thing of, you know, that, that Jesus is the same as an animal? 
you know, the animals were in type like Christ, okay? But they are not Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, Jesus Christ is likened to a lamb, but he was not a lamb. Apparently that's a bit too deep for Stephen Anderson to understand, I guess. But let's continue. One more little clip here, and then we're going to watch the James White stuff. But well, let's see about this. Okay, what it, what it really is, is that Jesus went to hell and suffered the wrath of God for our sins. He suffered the wrath that we might not have to suffer that wrath. He suffered it for us, and he paid the, the punishment for our sins. So let me get this straight again. Jesus, body, soul, spirit, went to hell so he could suffer the wrath of God. But God is the soul. So how can he be in hell suffering God's wrath when God is right there in the person of Jesus Christ? You see the problem. Just incredible. Now we're going to watch some of this James White thing here. And I don't know, some of this stuff is just, it's very, very vexing to even listen to. Uh, this is near the end of the, the interview between James White and, and Ander Snake here. And it's, it's funny because it's like watching two lost people, you know, debate over scripture. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird, you know, and uh, neither one of them has a clue about anything. Uh, both of them reject the Bible. Both of them have no higher authority on this earth than themselves. And um, I don't believe either one of them is saved. So, but let's, let's just watch some of this and it, it just, we'll try to get through it. It's, it's kind of very convoluted and, and confusing, but I'll pause it occasionally just to make some comments. So here we go. Hades, eight times, because the, 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 the term Hades is used 10 times in the Greek New Testament. Eight times they translate it as Hades, or transliterate it as Hades. They don't, they leave it untranslated as Hades, okay? Two times they change it to something completely different, the grave, okay? Yes, and that is. In, that is in Acts chapter 2 about Jesus Christ, because in Jesus Christ it says, he was not abandoned to the grave, neither did his flesh see corruption. In the King James, in Acts 2.31, the Bible says, this spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So in the King James, if I'm going to be King James only, if I'm going to believe that the King James is my final authority, mm -hmm. then I believe that Jesus Christ's soul was in hell for three days and three nights. Now, if I'm reading the NIV, I'm not going to get that. I'm just going to think we're talking about only the bodily aspect of his body coming out of the grave, not the fact that his soul well, I don't, came out of hell. Let I me ask this, do you believe that Jesus' soul went to hell? Hades. Not hell. There's nobody in hell. But a minute ago... It is oh, wrong. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It is wrong, okay, wrong, I'm sorry. wrong to I'm say sorry. Jesus was in hell. Okay, wrong. let me say it in a way... Okay, let me ask you this. Okay, let me just pause it here. Um, what moron on the right here is doing, James White, he is saying that hell is actually falsely translated because you see that that chamber down there, it was hell, you know, was was the place where the lost go and therefore... Abraham's bosom was, it shouldn't have been called hell. It's, just read the Bible. You aren't going to come away confused like this. You know, but he's, oh, it should be retranslated. It should be translated differently and stuff. Again, listening to either one of these guys is just going to lead you into confusion. Uh, I'm showing this simply to point out the fact that Anderson is a lost, lying, false prophet. All right. Uh, but we'll, we'll continue here. Do you believe that Jesus' soul went to the Paradise. same place Paradise. that, that the, the guy thief. was burning in Luke 16. No, of course not, because Hades had two compartments. Everybody knew that. I don't look, believe look, that. Look, oh, oh, really? Where's, where's, I don't where's, that. where's the poor man in Luke 16? <laughs> okay, this <laughs> shows you how bad Stephen Anderson is. I mean, even James White understands that there are two compartments down there, you know? And the one's paradise there where they, the Old Testament saints go, and the other is hell where they go and they burn. The lost people go and they burn. Even James White understands this. And Anderson just goes, I don't believe that. And James White's like, oh, really? You know, like, what? <laughs> this is how bad it is. 
But see, again, see the little Jesuitical game that's being played here. Thesis, antithesis. All right, you have antithesis being James White, thesis being Stephen Anderson. See, Stephen Anderson represents King James only people. So you have James White representing the new modern hip, any Bible, but no Bible crowd. You know, any Bible, you, you can read any Bible, but no Bible is the perfect word of God. Uh, they're all just translations and the Greek text is, is always subject to revision. So there is no Bible. That's his crowd. So the Jesuits, they present two tonal, totally false paradigms. They say, Either you're a nut like Stephen Anderson that hates people and, and says people should be killed and murdered because we're still in the Old Testament uh, in terms of law and things like this and, and uh, you know, there are no dispensational differences. Either you're with Stephen Anderson, Jesus burned in hell Anderson, or you're with James White. You see? See how the little game is played? Uh, if you're a Bible believer, you're not with either one. All right? And I trust that's where you are. Well, let's continue. Where's the poor man? He's Luke 16. Heaven. He's not in heaven. He's absolutely He's in Hades. Heaven. He's in heaven. No, no. See, this is, this is, yeah. this is, this is, the, you would, you would, you would never survive a debate with a conditionalist on this because Hades. <laughs> I don't Hades, even know what a conditionalist is. The, so people, who, the, gonna... the, people, the people who deny <laughs> eternal conscious punishment. It's a huge okay. movement today. It's, it's, it's. Rob it's, Bell. Okay. Again, you know, look, look at James White. You would never survive a debate. Uh, well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that debate is a sin. <laughs> okay, it's listed with the things that, that come from a reprobate mind. And when God turns somebody over to a reprobate mind, that one of the things that they do is debate. So James White's whole ministry proves that he has a reprobate mind. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just interesting because, you know, James White actually asks him, he says, where's Lazarus? And Anders Snake says, in heaven. So, you know, again, showing this teaching that Anders Snake is saying that the rich man in hell is looking up through the earth somehow, and he sees Abraham and Lazarus in heaven. Absolutely, totally absurd. They're up there before the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed. How'd they get up there? And see, the non-dispensational crowd, these kooky Bathlicks like this, Baptist Catholics is, you know, we combine it to make Bathlick, you know. Um, trying to save people time, make it more modern, update the English and all that good stuff, you know. But uh, the modern bath, or many of these bathlicks, I should say, they'll try to say that, that people in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the cross. I actually saw some ninwit, or nitwit, excuse me, nitwit, uh, actually wrote that, that people that have always, you know, saved people throughout all time have always been Christians. <laughs> and like, okay, why does Acts chapter 11, verse 26 say, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Uh, yeah. And why is it, and I did a whole study on this, the thing of, of people being saved by looking forward to the cross and how that doesn't work. Um, I did a whole study on it. And, you know, you can look in, in the Gospels. Jesus is explaining how he's going to die on the cross. People are going, what? You know, Peter actually rebukes him at one point and says, be it far from me, Lord, you know. Even after Jesus dies on the cross and he comes back up from the dead, they're still going, I don't believe he you know, rose from the dead. Well, how, why would that be true if they're saved by looking forward to the cross? See, the whole thing doesn't work. But let's, let's watch more of Dumb and Dumber here, okay? Or whatever. Oh, please. Okay, uh, let's, let's, someone serious. <laughs> That's um, not what I've heard of. Okay. <laughs> no, Hades had two compartments. Yeah, I don't believe that. It's a fact. Okay, what if read, I show you old, the, what if I show you Old Testament read, scriptures read, of the saved being in heaven? Read the Jewish scriptures. Read read Whoa, the, the Jewish scriptures. I'm sorry. Uh, wow. Read read what the Jews themselves understood at the time of Jesus. Okay, pause it again. Read what the Jews at the time understood. About, you know, and all that. You got to go back to the see what James White is doing here is he is using his scholarly intellect to take you away from scripture. You know, and I mean, he said earlier, you know, to James White's credit, and I don't give him much credit, but he said, it's just a fact. You read there, there's two compartments. Luke chapter 16, we read it earlier. There are two compartments down there, the great gulf in between them. That's all you need. You don't need to say, read the Jewish, the, the ancient Jewish writings and stuff. You don't need that stuff. You don't need anything but the Bible. But see, James White doesn't believe in any perfect Bible today. Ask him.
Let's continue. When the, Jesus the ones who crucified look, him? No, no, no. When Jesus... Read what they understood? Yeah, what? You don't, you don't think that's relevant to understanding the background well, of the Old Testament? The they New didn't Testament? understand Christ's message. So? So why do I expect them any to understand anything else? Any, so, 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 so because they rejected Jesus means that everything Jesus said to them about the Korban rule. How do you know what the Korban rule is? Huh? How do you know? I can tell you what the Korban rule is. From the context in the King James Bible? Because it explains it in Matthew 15. Okay, where'd they get it from? You don't know because you won't look at those sources. The Korban well, rule... He's bringing up something that we shouldn't see, even care about because he's saying this is oh, your stupid tradition. Oh, we shouldn't even... But he's saying, he's, he's telling them, hold on, he's rebuking them for their Korban rule. Stephen, this is he's why... He's not saying Stephen, that. Stephen, this is, this is why I hope and pray that you will think about this. Because the fact that when I debate Roman Catholics, uh -huh. I can demonstrate to them the Korban rule according to the Mishnah. Do you know what the Mishnah was? Do you know what the Mishnah the was? Jewish fables? The Mishnah was the traditions that Jesus was specifically rebuking. talking about. He was rebuking and them. And it's good to know what they were so we have a background. I'm not interested in what they were, to be honest. Well, then you can't argue against Roman Catholics like I can because I'm going to take the time to find out what was going on back then. And the point is... To be honest with you, the, I'm not interested in arguing with Roman Catholics. Okay, uh, again, we see this thing. James White, see this, this good cop, bad cop, this, this thesis, antithesis, this little game that Jesuits will play. Um, either you're with stupid on the left, Anderson, or stupid on the right, James White. Anderson says, all you need is the Bible. Now, that's true. But he doesn't believe what the Bible says. So James White says, no, the Bible... The account is true, but you need more than the Bible to adequately debate Catholics and other people. You see? So it's like, which side are you on? You know, it's kind of like the thing, are you a Calvinist or an, or an uh, Armenian? Uh, I'm neither. I don't follow men. You know, I believe the Bible. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> okay. We'll continue watching a little bit more of uh, Nutty Nonsense here. Uh, I was going to chop up a lot of this stuff and get rid of some of this junk in here, but I, you know, I didn't get around to doing it, so we're just going to watch it. and, and uh, It's good comedy. So let's continue. Because I am, I'd I am rather interested, preach the gospel to Roman Catholics. I am interested in convincing them and explaining the gospel to them in a way that they can understand, not simply... Okay. preaching at them, but preaching but, the way but they can understand. But hold on a second. So, so I, let I, me just make this clear real quick. We have a fundamental difference in doctrine here. I yes, believe that Jesus Christ was in a place, his soul was in a place of fiery torment for three days and three nights I think it's heresy. before the resurrection. I think it's heresy. Okay. <laughs> so Anderson goes and he says, I believe that Jesus Christ was in a place of fiery torment for three days and three nights. And James White says, I think that's heresy. <laughs> See, again, you know, so you say, well, whose side should we be on? See the confusion that this is. See, the King, you know, James, James White is against the King James Bible, and yet he is saying the truth in this case. Anderson is for the King James Bible, but he's lying. You see how Satan is using these two devil worshipers right here, these two false prophets, their little argument. And, you know, you get people and they go, wow, look, a King James only advocate debating somebody for the new versions. Oh, I could find the truth here. You're not going to find the truth. This is deception. These guys both work for Satan. Let's continue. So we have a fundamental difference in doctrine here, and it is based upon which Bible we're reading. Because no, my, it's, it's well, not. hold on. My King James Bible says, hold on a second. Yeah. My King James Bible says that his soul was in hell. But you know that the Greek word is Hades. And you know but, that consistently but that but does not my, refer hold on, what's my to a final, place of punishment. What's my final authority? It should be what was but written what by... what is my final authority? The your King tradition. James. Your my, tradition. Hold on. This is my final authority. Your okay. tradition that so, those so English words are more okay. important than the Greek words from which they were translated. But hold on. <laughs> Again, see the, the little switching thing here going on between truth and lies. They're, they're switching it back and forth between the two. One minute James White's saying truth. Next minute he's lying. Then then Stephen Anderson says, my final authority is this right here. And James White says, your final authority there is your, your, your traditions, your, your English words, you know. 
See, see how these two guys are there. This, this thing is masterful deception. This is literally, I believe, two Jesuits purposefully crafting this thing. You know, and maybe it's just, maybe they're both really stupid and just being led by devil spirits. Maybe that's what's really going on. Maybe they aren't actually professional Jesuits. Maybe they're just lost reprobates that have devils speaking through them. Okay? Maybe it's not a conspiracy. Maybe it's just two devil possessed, you know, lost people arguing. You know, could be that. But let's continue watching a little bit more here. My final authority is the King James Bible. Therefore, if I open my English King James Bible, and in Acts 2.31, it says that Jesus' soul was in hell, and in all 54 mentions of hell, it's always a bad place, it's always fire and torment, mm -hmm. then that, I, I so, cannot believe anything other than so that. So when Jesus said to the, the thief, today mm -hmm. you will be with me in paradise, right. that was hell? He, no, because the thief is going to be with the Father in heaven, and, and that, Jesus speaks gonna, the, today that speaks to the Trinity. Today you will be with me in paradise. That speaks to the Trinity. Jesus was dead for three days and three nights. Okay. And here's the thing. Okay, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, brother. Again, see, James White makes a good point. When he says, the dying thief, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, where's he at? All right. The thief went down with Jesus, down there to the heart of the earth. Then Jesus led them out. Because the blood's been paid for, or the blood's paid for their sins. Now they can leave. They can go to heaven now. Right? That's where that, why there was a resurrection of Old Testament saints after Jesus Christ died on the cross. You know? So again, you see, who are you siding with here? So this is why debating is useless. It's a, it's a, a, a mark of a reprobate mind. But let's continue. Let's watch a little bit more. If he gave his life. He didn't have to go to hell. I believe and that he went to hell for three days and three nights. I he was a burnt it, sacrifice. Every sacrifice it, is a burnt sacrifice. I, I consider ab, that ab... Okay, okay why, hold on. Why is every sacrifice a burnt sacrifice? Okay, I'm, not, I'm not even going to bother any, anymore with that. because we're, we're, Why was the Passover even, roast with fire? Even, you won't even listen to the fact that Abraham is in a place with the uh, leper. In heaven. In heaven. Hades. I believe that he was in heaven. There's nowhere that okay. says right. that Abraham is in so, Hades. So, Fulton, so, so, so because here is a perfect example of where your commitment to an English rendering that you've recognized is inaccurate to the original No, term. I did not say you, that it's inaccurate. You said I that think you that saw I a difference believe, between Hades and I'm, Gehenna. I'm saying I don't believe that in the English language the distinction between Hades and Gehenna is necessary. I believe that so the word hell... Before, hold on. Aren't there two words in Greek that could be translated as the same word in English or German or Spanish? So I'm saying that the word hell is an accurate translation of Hades and an accurate translation of Gehenna. So That's what before I'm the English language, if all you read was the New Testament in Greek, you would have been misled here because no, you never I don't would have come so. to your conclusion. No, because if you, were reading, if you were reading the Greek New Testament, you'd read Luke chapter 16 that Hades is a place of fiery torment, and then you'd read the same author, Luke, tell you in Acts 2.31 that that's where Christ's soul was. Why Except do you think you Christ's would see that only Abraham, hope? Christ wants to get out of there. You see, you would see he that says Abraham. his soul, flesh, and hope because he's not going to be left there. Is that be if left? it's a good place, why does he not want to be left there? He wants to get out of there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so again, you know, we have this little stupid debating back and forth here. And, you know, please do not be confused by this, okay? These people do bring confusion but please understand that the, the biblical term hell is the right term, okay? They went to hell down there. And you say, well, but what about the Old Testament? The Old Testament, there was hell and there was Abraham's bosom and a great gulf between the two. Now, understanding that they were down in there, they could not get into heaven. As we looked at the scriptures earlier, they couldn't get into heaven because there was no blood to pay for their sins. Their sins were not taken away. You don't need to retranslate the King James Bible. The word hell is adequate for, or not adequate, it is the word that should be there for Hades and Gehenna. There's no problem there. None at all. Absolutely none. So neither one of these guys is right. Okay? But let's continue. Okay, another point I wanted to make here real quickly. I just had to skip back there and watch that. Uh, Anner Snake, another one of his little arguments is he'll say, if, if paradise is a good place down there in the heart of the earth, why did he want to get out of there? Okay, 
will not leave his soul in hell. Why not, if it's a good place? Uh, okay, them sleeping down there doesn't mean that it's as good a place as heaven. Right? The reason that they're down there in that holding area, you know, the, the spirits in prison down there, as the Bible talks about over in 1 Peter chapter 3, they're down there because there's no way that they can get into heaven. Heaven's where they want to go. The hope of the resurrection, they want to go up. So it's not that, oh, it's a good place down there, and so Jesus shouldn't have wanted to leave there or something like this. See, again, he's saying that Jesus was suffering in hell, burning in hell, suffering, and that's why he wanted to get out. His soul was not left in hell. It's stupid, absolutely stupid. Well, let's watch the, the one last thing here. And uh, James White, basically, at the end of the thing, he just finally, Anderson just will not let this thing go. He just, in his pride... He's just like, oh, that's the way it is, that's the way. And James White finally just says, okay, interview's over. I'm done. This is, this is ridiculous. Shuts his mic off. But listen to what Anderson says. It's a legitimate argument that I'm making that millions of people agree with me on. Can you stop at some point? Do you have the capacity? <laughs> that's the question now. Okay. Anderson says it's a legitimate argument that millions of people believe in. And James White just laughs at him and he says, can you stop? Is there some point that you can stop arguing? You know? But Anderson says that millions of people believe in this thing that Jesus Christ went to hell and burned. Uh, I can assure you that that is an absolute total lie. Uh, I don't know any serious Bible preachers that, that have ever taught this, that Jesus burned in hell. All right, so you know that's going to be it for this video. I, I'm not going to keep you know going on about this thing. It's just, I mean, scripture after scripture after scripture that we looked at today, proving that it's the blood that was shed on the cross that pays for our sins. Jesus being buried and rising again is just proof that he's God. All right, and of course, if you believe that he shed the blood, but he didn't, wasn't buried and didn't rise again, well, you got a problem there. I mean, that's part of the gospel, that he shed his blood, was buried, and rose again. But there's no mention anywhere in the New Testament of Jesus actually physically burning in hell to pay for sins. When the Bible says that his soul was not left in hell, it's talking about that underground chamber there that was separated by a great gulf, that underground chamber that is no longer there in terms of for saved people, people in the Old Testament that didn't have the blood there to pay for their sins yet. You don't go down anymore. Your flesh, your body of flesh goes into the grave awaiting the catching away of the body of Christ. But this teaching that, you know, people just went right to heaven in the Old Testament, it wasn't even possible. It contradicts Scripture. So all this study was done for one very important reason, and that is to show people that the debate is over. There is no more debate. Um, Stephen Anderson is not a saved man because according to him, his gospel, his beliefs there, he says, you know, well, it's just the death, burial, and resurrection. But he, but he goes on to say that if you want to be doctrinally correct, you have to believe that Jesus also burned in hell. Um, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Stephen Anderson doesn't have the Spirit of God by the Bible's own standard. He calls Jesus Christ accursed. And not just Jesus. He says the body, the soul. And he kind of says the Spirit at the beginning. He says the Spirit, I mean the, the soul, you know. So the God had bodily burned in hell for three days to pay for sin. Impossible. Totally impossible. This lying blasphemer right here uh, has been exposed by myself, by others, and uh, there's no chastening. And so according to Hebrews chapter 12, I believe it's verse 8, um, he's a bastard. He's not one of God's sons. He is not my brother in Christ. He's not your brother in Christ. He is a lying false prophet. And uh, Stephen Anderson, if you're watching this, um, I'm just going to say this to you. Uh, your time is coming. You have blasphemed God now on quite a few occasions. 
Uh, you are a liar. You are a deceiver. And um, if you can lower your pride enough uh, to admit that you have been wrong, that you have a spirit of Antichrist, if you can lower your pride enough, there's a chance that you can still get saved. But uh, to be quite frank, I don't think that you can do it. I think that you've gone past that point now where it would cost you too much and you would, your pride does not let you come to God as a sinner. And therefore, you're headed for destruction. And uh, I believe that that destruction is coming very soon. So if you have been taken in by Stephen Anderson and his lies, uh, I would suggest that uh, you really seriously think about what he's really saying the gospel is, that Jesus Christ burned in hell. Um, think about what, where he is taking you uh, into a position where God's promise is, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. If you haven't seen my study on the two different flags of Israel's flag and Jerusalem, their capital city, which is right here behind me, uh, you might want to watch that video and see that, in fact, this Jerusalem flag, the official flag of the city of Jerusalem, is actually prophesying the return of the Lion of the tribe of Judah right there behind me. The Hebrew word there, right here is Jerusalem. This is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The wall, the kotel there, I think is how you pronounce it, the, the wailing wall, basically. And you have the two olive branches. It's a prophecy about what's going to come in the future. And they don't even realize it. The Jews that put that together don't even realize they're prophesying their own future. Jesus Christ is coming back. Um, and if you have seen this study, you will see that, in fact, uh, the prophecies in the Old Testament have this king that returns, their Messiah. He comes back the second time and they say to him, you know, where did you get those scars in your hands and your feet? And he says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. You know, and again, you know, watch the video. I get into all the scriptures there. God brings back the nation of Israel in unbelief for his sake. And he restores that nation of Israel. You see, this whole debate is about real estate. It's about land. That's what this whole thing is about. And, you know, I'm going to be talking more about replacement theology and actually covering it in an, in an upcoming video. I'm not sure when I'm going to get to that because I have a couple other projects I need to do first. And uh, this is, you know, a very important one I didn't need to do here. But, you know, the, the point is this whole subject is really a question of the validity of Scripture and the validity of God's promise to Abraham's seed, Isaac. And uh, if God has rejected giving that land that he promised to Abraham's seed for an inheritance, they've never been able to have it yet because they haven't had a proper king to rule over them, but they will when Jesus Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years. Um, but if God broke that promise to physical people for physical land, then God's a liar. And if God's a liar, then uh, he's no longer God. Because the Bible says God cannot lie. That's why Satan is very anxious to have his ministers come out and charge God as a liar. Charge God as a, as a being that had to go to hell and burn. So, I uh, just wanted to put this video together and... and it just, you know, like I said at the beginning of the video, I've debated back and forth over the years. Is Steven Anderson saved? Is he lost? Is he, you know, I've tried to have a lot of grace for him. But after seeing these videos, after seeing what he has preached for his gospel, he's lost. There's no way that this guy's saved. No way. Um, and that's, I mean, this is just the start of his heresies. I mean, it's, this is just, I mean, or maybe you could say the nail, the final nail in the coffin of Steven Anderson. And um, just really, really bad. So that is going to be it for this video. I'm starting to lose my voice. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've been talking for a long time here. Um, this has been kind of a long one, a long study. But uh, I just uh, I wanted to really do a thorough job on this thing. And there's a lot more scriptures we could go to. But, you know, you have to put an end to it somewhere. I mean, a lot of you, you know, you'll put 
scriptures down in the comments, and I'm always like, ah, man, I could have used that scripture, you know. But, you know, that's the great thing about being a Bible believer, the, the fellowship of the Spirit that we have, and how so many of you, you know, you, as you're going through this video, you watch it and you go, hey, you know, praise the Lord, you know, I, this Lord just gave me this verse, and boy, that would have been good for Brother Brian to use, but I thank you for putting it down in the comment section. So, that's going to be it for the video. Um, I'm going to stop talking now. And uh, got some more interesting stuff coming out. Uh, I'm not going to keep refuting Stephen Anderson. Uh, I could waste all my time doing that. But I felt that this was so important that this guy is in our ranks as a supposed King James Bible believer. Uh, he's not. Um, he's fake. He's not a Bible believing Christian. Um, he is definitely a false prophet a lying uh, deceiver. So that will be it. We thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you all those out there that support the ministry through donations. We, we really appreciate that. I like to mention that every once in a while. Thank you very much. I'm going to be hopefully coming out with some more uh, studies here not related to this, but um, some interesting things coming up. Uh, but I uh, really needed to talk about this. Because uh, I've been after this guy for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm not obsessed with him. I'm obsessed with this book. And when people claim to preach and teach this book, and they don't line up with this book, and I see them deceiving people and heading the Bible-believing movement in a very dangerous direction, uh, calling for people to be killed and things like this, like Stephen Anderson does, um, it is my duty to warn people. So that's why I'm doing these studies. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.